Yeah, I know. Where, you know, if you had told me when I was eight or nine years old, or when I was your age, that someday I'd be able to have somebody like Brian talk about what we're about to do, which is we're going to go back to the moon and land on the moon again. And Brian is working on all these different landing sites, and he's going to tell about tell us about all the horrible things about each of the places. You know, Brian, has it occurred to you guys that landing on the South Pole of the Moon is a really dangerous thing to do? Okay, good. Uh, it is really dangerous. And so uh, it's, you know, it's like, this. Uh, by the way, one of the great things, I don't think, Brian, Brian, that people have realized about that landing site is, if you've ever seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, you see the spaceship coming in to land on the moon. And then there are these two astronauts up on this hill overlooking the landing site. And in the horizon, you can see the Earth. And from that, I bet you this has occurred to you guys, that if you're on the South Pole of the Moon, the Earth is low on the horizon. And so we're actually going to be able to see a view like that, just like out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Anyway, so uh, now, I, now comes, I have to introduce Brian. So Brian Day is the staff scientist for NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Visual Institute, which is also called SURVE. His in Are you laughing? Oh, that's sneezing. Okay. Uh, his duties in this role include serving as Survey's lead for lunar and planetary mapping and modeling. He is the science lead for NASA's Solar System Trex family of data visualization and analysis portals. By the way, we, he was the one who gave our first virtual reality program shortly before the outbreak of COVID. If you remember that, that was a great program that he did. And then... And, okay, he also serves as a member of NASA Speakers Bureau, so we're going to be really nice to him because he's going to help us get other speakers from NASA Ames. You can just tell us who they are, Brian, and we won't tell that you faked on them. Okay, uh, giving presentations on NASA's space science and exploration to audiences of all ages. He has participated in numerous terrestrial analog studies working in extreme environments on Earth that simulate some aspects of the moon and Mars. Um, Brian, can you say Mono Lake? Very good. And by the way, it's right on the trip to Barcroft. Uh, and uh, yeah, extreme environments of Earth that simulate some aspects of the moon and Mars. Uh, he previously served as education and public outreach lead for both the L Cross and Laddie robotic lunar missions. And in 2007, he flew on NASA's Arigid Mac mission to examine fragments of Comet Keys entering Earth's upper atmosphere as a meteor shower. So tonight, Brian is going to speak to us about lunar landing sites past and future. Ryan, go ahead. Thank you very much. I have a mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just share, remember to share your screen. And I will do so. We will share the screen and hopefully, oh, and this meeting is being recorded. Got it. Okay. So. Ryan, there are a lot more people watching you online than are here in person. Don't, don't be <laughs> Uh, I wasn't until you said that. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for coming tonight. We are at a rather momentous time. We are about to start a new generation of lunar exploration. It got dark. Um, and for those of you, that many of you in this room are not old enough to remember, but the Apollo days were really, really, really exciting and very inspirational. And I would like to think that we're going to see something equally or more exciting and also very inspirational. And so as we are standing at the beginning of this new age of lunar exploration, what I'd like to do is take a look back at the places that we went to on the moon previously? Where did we send astronauts to before? Why did we choose these places? What did we learn from them? And then look ahead to where we're planning to go next. And there we go. So we'll start out with Apollo. And uh, between July 69 and December of 72, there were six missions that sent astronauts to the surface of the moon. 12 people walked on the surface of the moon in total over a very short period of time. The first of these was the Apollo 11 mission. And uh, this was very daring. It went to a place called the Sea of Tranquility. 
Uh, the commander was Neil Armstrong, the lunar module pilot Buzz Aldrin, and command module pilot Michael Collins remained in orbit while the other two went down to the surface. And then the idea was he'd be waiting for them when they came back up. And uh, so they went to a place, again, called the Sea of Tranquility. And the Sea of Tranquility, uh, basically, their landing site was right here. And the reason that we chose this place was not because it was some place of great particular scientific interest. The, way, the reason it was chosen is because, unlike the surrounding lunar highlands, the Sea of Tranquility is smooth and flat. And so this being the first attempted human landing, the idea was to choose a place that was going to be as easy and as safe to land as possible. And so the smooth, flat lava plains of Sea of Tranquility looked very, very good. Here we're coming down and it's looking good. And uh, oh, oh, uh, Neil looked out his window and he saw this. This is called West Crater. And the guidance system of the lunar module was bringing them right down to West Crater. As you can see, there are a bunch of boulders there. These are about the size of good sized automobiles. And Neil looked out the window and he realized, oh, we cannot land here. So at the last moment, he took manual control of the lunar module and started flying to the west, looking for a smooth place to land. And with only a couple seconds remaining of fuel, he touched down on the ground. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and so touched down on the ground. Uh, the response from mission control was, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue here. Because again, it was seconds of fuel remaining. But in this view taken from orbit now by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we're looking down, we are seeing the lower stage of the lunar module. This is what they actually descended to the surface of the moon. There it is. You can see two little white dots below it. That's a lunar laser retroreflector and a passive seismometer that they left on the surface. And if you look very carefully, you can see some dark squiggly lines going around. Those are the actual footprints of the astronauts taken from orbit around the moon. So, that was a big success. It was, the landing was a little hairier than anybody thought, but it worked. So with Apollo 12, one of the big goals was to refine this landing capability and to really be able to stick a landing. And uh, also there was a scientific effort here. Um, you can see the, uh, circle, the planned landing area, and it's below the crater Copernicus. Copernicus is an important object for us in lunar chronology. We take surface features on the moon and we essentially divide up, well, this came before that, this became before that, and this is, this is one of our main guideposts in chronology. But we could only do, up until Apollo, we could only do relative dating. We could say, you know, well, Mari Embryum is older than Copernicus, and Copernicus is older than Tycho, and, but we didn't know, have any precise numbers. And so what we needed to do is bring back material from some of these guideposts, these signposts, so that we could actually assign numbers to them. Now, Copernicus is way too nasty a place to land. It's rugged, it's mean, it's nasty, and they weren't ready to do that. But one of the nice things about Copernicus is you can see it has this spray of material going out, these rays, pulverized rock from the impact. And some of these rays of pulverized rock extend out over the flat lava plains to the south. And so that was the plan, was to descend to the nice, safe, flat lava plains, but land on one of these rays of pulverized rock from Copernicus. And while with Apollo 11, the plan was to avoid, try to avoid craters, 
With Apollo 12, the plan was to land right next to craters so that we could actually have the astronauts pick up material from the surface, but then pick up material that had been excavated for them by the impact craters. And so actually be able to sample different layers of the lunar strata. And so there you can see up kind of above center, you can see the lunar module for Apollo 12. And it had landed right among these craters. And the astronauts got out and they walked around and they went into some of those craters, but they also wanted to demonstrate that pinpoint landing capability. So there you see the lunar module in the upper left, but if you look down in the lower right, there's something else sitting there. That is the robotic Surveyor 3 spacecraft that had landed there two and a half years earlier. And so what they wanted to do is see if they could land right next to Surveyor 3 and then go over to Surveyor 3 and actually ret retrieve some of the electronics from Surveyor 3 and bring them back to see how that equipment had stood up to the harsh environment of the moon over two and a half years. So again, here you can see, uh, I think this is probably Pete Conrad, but he's standing there right there at Surveyor 3. And right in the background, you can see the lunar module. They stuck this landing. This was good. Next, we had Apollo 14. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that, yeah, because uh, that west crater that they were descending to, that was, that was actually far to the west of where they were planning. Yeah, it took a while to find out where they were. Yeah, it was, uh, and yeah, I know Jim very well. He has, Jim has great stories. <laughs> um, so Apollo 14, uh, this here we had our, the commander was Alan Shepard, America's first astronaut. Uh, the uh, lunar module pilot, Edgar Mitchell, accompanied him down to the surface of the moon and Stuart Ruza remained in orbit. And... Now they decided to try something different. Instead of going down to the flat, even lava plains, they went to a place called the Fra Mauro Formation. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to sample some of another major signpost for us, the Imbrium Basin. And if you look in the upper left of the moon here, you see a large kind of elliptical dark structure there in the upper left portion of the moon. That's, that's the that's Mare Imbrium. And that basin clearly happened before Copernicus, but how much before? And so they wanted to gather samples of that. Now, landing in that basin would not work because sometime after that basin formed, Magma welled up through cracks in the crust and flooded that basin with lava. So if you were to actually land in Mare Imbrium, what you would do is you would just sample that lava that came up sometime later. You wouldn't know when Imbrium formed. So what they had to do instead was to land on some of the debris that had been kicked out from the formation of Mare Imbrium. And that is the Fra Moro formation. And here you can see instead of flat lava plains, you have these rolling hummocky hills. Again, this is massive amounts of debris that had been kicked out by the formation of the Imbrium Basin. So a little more challenging of a landing. And they ended up landing. You can see the lunar module in the lower left corner there. And uh, they ended up making a traverse up toward, up, it's, you can't see it here, but it's actually up a fairly steep slope toward that crater called Cone Crater. And again, they wanted to see what Cone Crater might have excavated so that we could get material from different layers. Along the way, they encountered a rock. 
they encountered many rocks and they brought back quite a few of them. One of the rocks they encountered was about the size and shape of a football. And uh, this rock has become known as Big Bertha. And Big Bertha got famous a couple years back because, well, Big Bertha is an interesting type of rock. It is uh, what we call a breccia. So it is a bunch of different types of moon rock that have been broken up and then welded together by the heat and energy of subsequent meteoroid impacts. And so you get this kind of Frankenstein type of moon rock. And, so, yeah, and the breaches are really, really neat. And if you don't believe me, come up after the talk and I will show you one. I brought a lunar breccia with me so we, you can look at that. Maybe you get a selfie taken with it, yeah. But again, so it's pieces, uh, different pieces of rock all put together. And the analysis of this goes on still today. But one class within Big Bertha just wasn't fitting. This, this just came out a few years back. People started doing a real close analysis of this rock. And it just didn't seem to be like any moon rock they had seen. Now, I'm an astronomer by training. Uh, astronomers aren't the only kinds of scientists at NASA. We're just the best looking scientists at NASA. But there are many different types of scientists at NASA. And they, they include geologists. If you become a geologist, you learn to be able to hear and understand the stories that rocks have to tell. Rocks tell us stories of how they formed, where they formed, when they formed, and the conditions under which they formed. And so people started listening to the story that this class within Big Bertha had to tell. And it told a very interesting story. It was telling them that apparently it was not a moon rock at all. Now, Moon rocks are especially interesting to us. Again, we, we really like studying moon rocks because, you know, again, we want to hear these ancient stories. Now, we, here on Earth, you know, we would, we're very dependent upon the Earth, and we would love to be able to hear the stories of the oldest rocks here on Earth. You know, how did our planet form? But we can't find any of those rocks because here on Earth we have wind and we have rain erosion that turned rocks to dust. We have plate tectonics that resurface and repave the earth over and over again. So if you want to find any really, really, really old rocks on earth, you're out of luck. But we know that the earth and moon formed together about 4.6 billion years ago in a giant collision. And so they had share a common origin. On the moon, there is no wind. On the moon, there is no rain. And on the moon, there is no plate tectonics. And so we can find rocks on the moon that are far older than we can find on Earth. And that was part of the motivation of going to the moon, finding these rocks that are very, very old and have a common history with the Earth. And gee, that's great. And I love telling that story for years. But then, like I say, the story got a lot better because of this little class within Big Bertha. Because this little class in Big Bertha said, I am not a moon rock. I am an earth rock. And I formed between 4 and 4.1 billion years ago, 12.4 miles down. Whoa. And apparently what happened at that time, again, the solar system was a very crowded, very violent place, and a large asteroid slammed into the earth at very high speed and blasted a whole lot of material from deep inside the Earth out up into space. And some of that material, including this little rock, landed on the surface of the moon. But that little rock did not get to rest in peace there very long because 3.9 billion years ago, another asteroid came along slammed into the moon, forming the Imbrium Basin. And so from the standpoint of our little earth rock sitting on the moon, it would have seen 
this great giant glowing red tsunami coming over the northern hemisphere, rolling over it, burying it, and welding it to the local moon rock. And there it should have remained buried for the rest of time. Except 26 million years ago, here comes another asteroid, slams it to the moon, excavates Cone Crater, digs up our little moon rock, put, uh, earth rock, puts it back on the surface for Alan Shepard to come walking along saying, hey, I like that rock, picking it up and bringing it back to Earth. So the oldest earth rock we have ever seen was kept and preserved for us by the moon. Neat story. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to remind everybody that the Apollo 14 landing site is where Apollo 13 was supposed to have landed. And if you ever watch the movie, you hear that uh, Tom Hanks and Jim Lowell talked about going into 2012 somewhere. Yeah, they, they, that's where they wanted to go. Uh, Apollo 13 was not able to land there. But it's such an interesting place, such a critical place, that Apollo 14 was redirected to go there. But remember we talked about that Imbrium Impact Basin. What a neat place it is. Well, it was irresistible. And so with Apollo 15, they went to the Imbrium Impact Basin. Uh, you had Commander Dave Scott, uh, Lunar Module Pilot James Irwin, and uh, Al Warden remained in orbit. And they went to the Imbrium Impact Basin. They went to the edge of the Imbrium Impact Basin. And the method, method behind their madness here was that the rim of the Imbrium Impact Basin is this beautiful mountain range here, the Apennine Mountains. Now, when you look at the moon, you see this dichotomy. There's the smooth, dark areas, and then there's the rough, rugged, lighter colored lunar highlands. And we realized from very early on that the dark, lowlands, the basaltic plains, are younger than the light-colored highlands. And we wanted to get some of that highland rock because it promised to be significantly older. But the lunar highlands were a little too rugged to try and shoot a landing on. So the idea was to land on the very edge of the Imbrium Basin, right next to the mountains and drive up to the edge of the mountains and hope that maybe some of the rocks from, really old rocks from up above had rolled down and were retrievable. And so they picked a site right against the edge of the mountains, but that site was even more interesting because if you look here, there's something that looks to be a dry riverbed, but no water ever flowed here. This is Hadley Rill, and this was carved by flowing lava. This is a channel of, uh, dry channel now. It's about 370 meters deep. Uh, it goes for about 130 kilometers. And it originated from the eruptive centers you see in the lower left there, those kind of pit craters. And you can imagine a river of hot lava flowing across the surface, carving its way through the terrain there. And so you've got this wonderful, cool lava channel. You've got these wonderful mountains. How could you resist? And uh, for the first time, they brought a car with them. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And so now you can really cover some territory. They could really go a lot further than any of the other astronauts could. And so they drove up to Hadley Rill, got this in these incredible views. And in the background, we see Mount Hadley Delta there. And uh, they, when they went to Mount Hadley Delta, they actually did find a piece of the real light colored rock that had rolled down. And that was the oldest rock that they had that had been retrieved to date. They called that the Genesis rock. And they brought that back. This is not Genesis, by the way. They spent a long time on the slopes of Mount Hadley Delta, longer than had been planned. And so on the way back, as they were driving back toward the lunar rover, Mission Control called them up and said, hey, you are behind schedule. You will therefore cancel all of your remaining planned stops and just head back directly to the lunar module. We don't want you running out of oxygen. Head directly back. Well, Dave Scott is a very smart guy. 
And he realized just how much reserve they had. He was not worried, but he understood the concern. And so he agreed to that, and that's fine. But then as they're driving along, he looks out and he sees this. And he goes, oh my God, I want that. But he realized that if he called Mission Control and said, hey, I want to stop and go get this really cool rock, he knew that they would say no. But as I said, Dave Scott is a very smart guy. So he got on his radio and he said, hey, I've got a problem with my seatbelt. And they said, well, you will stop immediately and you will fix that. That's a safety issue. So he stopped, unclipped, got out, ran over, grabbed this rock, came back, clipped back in. He says, all set. Very good. And they drove back. This is now known as seatbelt rock. And this is what we call, this is vesiculated basalt. Really cool. That's a real story. Oh, there are a lot, there are a lot more. <laughs> you're, you're getting the, the light version. Uh, actually, um, that comes from the actual transcripts and, and talking with Dave. Yeah. Uh, um, they're, they're, just so many good stories. I uh, back back in the day, my parents and Jim Irwin's parents knew each other, and so yeah, I, it, it was good. It was fun. Lots of good stories. Um, Apollo sixteen. Now we're getting bolder. It was decided that it was time to attempt a landing in the rough, rugged lunar highlands to see that really ancient material. And so the commander was John Young, who became famous for a number of flights after that, including uh, the first space flight of the shuttle program. And uh, the lunar module pilot was Charlie Duke. And command modules remaining in orbit was Tom Mattingly. And they went to a place called the Descartes Highlands. So again, here we're looking at the moon you see those nice, smooth, dark areas, and that's not where they went. They went to the rough, rugged highlands there, and this doesn't look anything like the Sea of Tranquility. They were coming down. This required some flying, and they landed in this very, very, very light-colored area. You can see the burn marks there around the lunar module at the bottom, but they landed successfully, and uh, they did a number of now, they thought that the leading theory at the time was that there was a different type of volcanism that formed the, this lunar highland area. And uh, they sampled, they went up to a place called North Ray Crater and were able to sample material from multiple layers. And they discovered this was not volcanic at all. This is ancient, ancient, ancient lunar crust. Crust that formed when the moon was very young, it was covered with a magma ocean. And as that magma started to cool, crystals started forming. And the heavier materials sank down to the bottom of the ocean, but the lighter material that crystallized floated up to the top as a foamy froth. And that got thicker and thicker, and it solidified, and it formed this aluminum-rich crust of a North Acidic rock. And uh, so that's how this crust came to be. And we didn't know that until we got the rocks back from Apollo 16. The last of our Apollo missions was Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions to go to the moon. And uh, we had the commander was Gene Cernan. And the lunar module pilot was a gentleman called, named Harrison Jack Schmidt. And uh, the inside joke for those of us who hang out with Jack is, you know, you meet someone, you're going to introduce people, and they say, oh, but you don't know Jack Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, Jack is interesting because he is the first professional scientist to go to the moon. PhD in geology. Very, very, very useful person to have there. And wow, did they go to a neat place. They went to a place called the Taurus Littrow Valley. 
And the Taurus Litro Valley is right on the edge of the Sea of Serenity in this embayment that goes into the surrounding highlands. This is a deep valley. This is deeper than the Grand Canyon. So imagine we've gone from Apollo, in just a few years, we've gone from Apollo 11, shooting the safest possible landing we can imagine, to Apollo 17, doing this daredevil ride down into something like the Grand Canyon. Gene Cernan was a really good pilot, incidentally. So they went down into this canyon, they landed, and it was a spectacular location. Looking to the north, they had the mountains of North Massif. And again, ancient, ancient material here. But the neat thing is you can, if you look closely, you can see tracks, boulder tracks, where boulders rolled down. And so that meant they could go to the, go sample material from way, way, way up there and tell exactly where it came from by tracing the track, but it would have rolled down and become accessible to them. And so that's what they did. And so here you see, uh, I believe this is Jack here, sampling one of the boulders that had rolled down the face of North Massif. Now, on the other side, there's South Massif. And South Massif had this massive landslide that had come down off it and covered much of the valley floor. But then in the middle of this light rock of this massive landslide, there's this dark, dark crater. And it had been noticed before by some of the previous Apollo astronauts in orbit. They said, look at that really dark crater in the middle of all that light area. And they wondered, could that be a volcanic crater with dark volcanic ash that had spewed? Maybe this is a fresh volcanic crater on the moon. We got to send a geologist there. So they went there and Jack examined it. And he said, well, damn, this is just an impact crater. And what had happened is a small asteroid had hit that landslide deposit burrowed down into the dark mare material beneath, excavated that dark mare material. And so that's why you have the dark halo. And everybody was really disappointed. But then as they were walking along, they looked down and you know the moon is just shades of gray. And they looked down at their footprints and their footprints were orange. And they stopped and they, look at that. What in the world? And so they scooped up a bunch of this orange soil. And when they brought it back, they discovered that these are actually beads of volcanic glass that had been erupted long, long ago in a giant fire fountain eruption. And that had become part of the Mare lava deposit floor that then got covered up by the landslide, but then got excavated by the formation of Shorty Crater there. So we got some really neat stuff out of this. And here we're placing ourselves. This is a view that astronauts never had. The pictures I'm showing you here, with the exception of the lunar rover, these are not taken by the astronauts, by the way. I'll tell you about how we got these. But now what I've done is I've put us on the top of South Massif, looking out across the floor of the valley, of Taurus Litro Valley, and you can see those massive landslide deposits extending across the valley floor. Really amazing. What caused those landslide deposits? The leading theory at the time was Tycho, the impact that formed Tycho. That turned out to be wrong. And the actual culprit is visible here. You can see South Massif, just a little bit to the left of center there. And you can see the light spread of material from South Massif there, the landslide. But if you look very carefully, you will see cutting across that landslide, going across the valley, a dark line, dark sinuous line. That is what we call a lobate scarp. That is an earthquake fault on the moon. Now, when I was young, when I was in school, I learned that the moon is geologically dead. Well, almost. Figured that um, there might be moonquakes from 
asteroids hitting the moon, so shallow level moon quakes. You might also have shallow level moon quakes from rocks expanding and contracting as you go from the very hot daytime side to very cold nighttime side. And there might be really deep moon quakes caused by the tidal stretching of the moon by Earth's gravity. But in terms of internal geology, moon's going to be deader than a doornail. Well, a number of the Apollo missions took seismometers with them, including Apollo 17. And as a matter of fact, those three types of moon quakes that were predicted, yep, those all showed up. But then there was a fourth type of moon quake that no one is expecting. About 20 kilometers down getting up to magnitude 5.5 and lasting for over 10 minutes. Let me assure you right here and now, if you're in a magnitude 5.5 earthquake that's lasting for more than 10 minutes, you will quickly conclude that the object you're sitting on is not geologically dead. And uh, the moon is not. The moon is continuing to cool. It still has a hot interior, but it is cooling. And as it cools, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, the crust buckles. And that buckling forms these lobate scarps and these really interesting lunar earthquakes. So after the... Uh, after the Apollo programs, we had a series of unmanned spacecraft exploring the moon. And uh, they blew away another belief we had the moon, that the moon was bone dry, absolutely dry, don't even bother working, looking for water, there is none. And it turns out that is not correct. It turns out, thanks to the information, and I could go into great detail on all of these, but I will leave that for later, perhaps. But it turns out there is water on the moon. Most of it is in the form of ice at the poles of the moon. If you think of sunlight shining on the moon, if you think of it shining at the equator, the sunlight can shine straight down onto the surface of the moon. No shadows. But at the pole of the moon, the sunlight comes in horizontally. It's grazing the surface of the moon. And so if you have a crater at the pole of the moon, the sunlight doesn't shine down into it. It shines across it. So any rim that crater has is going to create a shadow. There are craters at the poles of the moon whose floors have not seen sunlight for over a billion years. Because they are so very, very dark and have been so dark for so very, very long, they are very, very cold. These are the coldest places we have measured anywhere on the solar, in the solar system, even colder than the surface of Pluto. And so if you're going to end up finding ice condensing anywhere, this would be a really good place to look. Yes. Um, at it is, I, I'm trying to remember, it gets down to somewhere approximately eight. <laughs> Cold. Yeah. Yeah, really close to absolute zero. Problems, you know, doing. Yeah. These are, yeah, we haven't really put thermometers down there. We can get some remote sensing, but, you know, at the most you know, a few tens of degrees and, you know, I mean, and there are variations. There are, there are not all permanently shadowed regions are the same. We can, that's another story. But we actually um, discovered the water ice uh, for sure. We had, we had good signs of it uh, from a number of missions, but the Elcross mission is how we actually got our hands wet, so to speak. And, <laughs> actually excavated one of these permanently shadowed regions and found 
water ice. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. That's another talk. <laughs> but I, I'd love to tell you that that, that was an, a that was a true adventure. Um, but the fact is that there are large quantities of water, probably billions of gallons worth in the form of ice, billions of tons even in these polar regions. And so that, people realized, could be very significant. It could make a sustained presence on the moon a whole lot easier. Because getting, you know, if you're going to live and work on the moon, you need water. You need water to drink. Getting water from the Earth to the moon is very, very expensive. Well, last I heard, it was about $4,000 a gallon. And you want a lot more than one gallon if you're going to live and work on the moon. So, um, but if it turns out there's large supplies of ice at the pole of the moon, and here's a big if, if that ice is accessible, then you can conceivably end up having water to drink. And then you can break apart that water ice into its component hydrogen and oxygen. And you can have oxygen to breathe, which is something you will really, really, really want to do if you're living and working on the moon. And you can have hydrogen as fuel. Water, ice is worth its weight in gold on the moon. So that is essentially an enabler for this new generation of lunar exploration, Artemis. And in mythology, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo and the goddess of the moon. And the plan is, when we have our first Artemis astronauts landing on the moon, it will include the first woman to walk on the moon. About time. But, this new generation of lunar exploration will be more than just human landers. It will be a mixture of human and robotic landers. And we're doing things a little bit different. You've probably heard about this, the CLIPS program, because now there is a whole new lunar economy starting up. Private companies that are providing delivery service to the surface of the moon. And so for a lot of experiments that NASA is designing to go to the moon, instead of building spacecraft ourselves and building rockets ourselves, we are buying space on some of these commercial delivery missions. So the CLIPS program, Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And then the PRISM program is where people can uh, propose to have these experiments that NASA will buy space for on these missions going to the moon. So let's take a look at some of the places we're planning to go and have been planning to go with some of these first preliminary robotic missions. One of the places we really want to explore is the Grutoisen Domes. Now, this is not the Grutoisen Domes. These, you know, we talked about all these lava plains on the moon, lots of lava. Well, that seems to imply volcanoes. But you don't see a bunch of Mount Rainiers or Mount Fujis on the moon. The lunar volcanoes tend to be very, very muted things. Small, blister-shaped, shallow shield volcanoes. I'm going to switch to a laser altimetry view, and they stand out a little better here. Um, very, very low-profile structures. These, these have slopes of only about one degree. And the reason behind this is that lunar lava tends to be very, very fluid, very runny, very low viscosity. It has a very low silica content. And so its viscosity is about that of olive oil at room temperature. And it's hard to build a mountain out of it. And so we get these very, very low profile volcanoes like we see here, the Hortensius domes. But there are exceptions. 
And right here, and you can see this in your telescopes. These are great targets for amateur telescopes. The Grüthuisen domes. And these are volcanoes. You don't need that kind of laser altimetry to see. These are tall, steep mountains standing 1,900 meters above the surface, the surrounding lunar highlands or lunar plains. There are uh, Grüthuisen Gamma and Delta are the big ones. And then there's Northwest. You can see kind of in the background to the upper left. These three Grutoisen domes made, these are very different than the typical lunar volcano. The lava that erupted here was thick and pasty. It is probably similar to andesite, the kind of lava that erupted in the Andes, thicker, pastier, building taller volcanoes. Why would the lava here be so very different? We don't know. That's why we want to go there. And so the first place that was planned was this bay of nice flat lunar highland right at the feet of the Grutoisen domes, Sinus Viscositatus. And the plan was to land there this month in January. And it was going to land aboard the Peregrine One lander from Astrobotic. You may have heard about it on the news. Shortly after launch, it had a problem with the propulsion system, a leak in the propulsion system. It did not make it to the moon. It swung around and back and burned up in the atmosphere a few days ago. So Peregrine One did not land on the moon, but this is, you know, this is hard. You know, there, there's an understanding, an expectation. These are high risk missions. And everybody who puts a payload on this understands that. And so we expected there were going to be some issues. And we'll learn from it. But that sinus viscositatis area is still interesting. And so we're not landing there, as a friend of mine at headquarters says, for now. But uh, the mission was really quite interesting. It uh, was... It launched on the maiden flight of the new Vulcan Centaur rocket, and that worked very, very well. It launched from a very historic launch site, uh, Slick 41, Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral. This is where we launched Elcross from. But we're not done with the Gutter Toys and Domes because we've got another mission planned to land a rover on the summit of one of the Grutois and Domes. Oh. So that is exciting. So that'll be coming up in the future. That's in development right now. So another place we're looking to go is Mare Crisium. So if you look at the moon, all of the places we had landed before with our astronauts were all kind of in that influence area from the great big impact basin. Yes, you have a question? So the uh, individual landers are being built by a number of different companies. As you'll see as we go through here, there's a whole bunch of different companies. So they're being built in many different places. So um, you know, it used to be if you wanted to work on a lunar lander, you went to work at NASA. Now there's a whole bunch of different companies that you can go and work at. So, oh, so the rockets? So the rockets are primarily um, right now two sources that's SpaceX and United Launch Alliance. The United Launch Alliance is a partnership between Lockheed and Boeing. So uh, those are the two main players right now, but there are new players getting in the field. Like I say, there's a whole new economy being built up. So we'll have much more competition in launch vehicles. We'll have much more competition in landers. And we like to think that's going to be a good thing. Brian, I'd like to talk about the launch vehicle. 
Okay, we should look at that. Um, okay, so all of our human landings had been in the kind of sphere of influence of that big Imbrium impact basin. We'd like to kind of get away from that. So over here is Mare Crisium. And let's, let's see how different things can be in Mare Crisium. And uh, so we'll zoom in. It's a nice flat area, nice and far away from Mare Imbrium. But as you zoom in, you see this. This is called Horseshoe Crater. And this is a cinder cone, a volcanic cinder cone that has been breached. You can see where the lava flowed out. This is really cool. This looks neat. We want to go there. Now, um, I work with a bunch of amateur astronomers and amateur lunar observers. And now and then I throw down challenge objects. And as you can see, um, there, there's a scale bar at the lower right there. You see two kilometers. This is not a big feature. And so uh, my challenge to the amateur lunar amateur community was, can you see, can you image Horseshoe Crater? I had never, ever seen an Earth-based image of this object before. And uh, so the plan is we're going there. This is a, a different lander from Firefly and their Blue Ghost lander. But here are some actual images of Horseshoe Crater taken by amateur astronomers. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so if you feel a need for a challenge, this is a good one. There's another view, so you can see uh, Mare Crisium, and you can see that little blip there of Horseshoe Crater. You gotta do it when the lighting is just right. Another place we wanna go, an example of a lunar swirl. No, that's not a cocktail. Uh, lunar swirls are really weird formations, and the, the prototype is a place called Reiner Gamma. And Reiner Gamma is another wonderful target for your telescopes. It's located on this far western edge of the moon. And if you look at it, it has this weird tadpole look. It's this light feature against the dark Mari background. And as you get closer, you see it's this sinuous mixture of light and dark areas. It's a really, you know, it looks vaguely familiar. You look at it, you go, there's something going on there. And it turns out that one of the big differences between the Earth and the Moon is the Earth has a global magnetic field. It does a very good job of protecting us from the solar wind. The Moon does not have a global magnetic field. But the Moon does have localized magnetic fields, areas, just small areas, where there are magnetic fields. And this is an example of one of those. And this, this interactive swirl of light and dark here seems to be tied to that. And if you think back to being a kid back in science class long ago, and maybe you took a bar magnet and you put a piece of white paper on top of it and you sprinkled iron filings, on top of that, and you can see the magnetic field lines trace out on the top of that paper. That seems to be what we're seeing here. And the dust on the surface of the moon tracing out this localized magnetic field. So why is there a localized magnetic field here? We don't know. That's why we want to go there. Look at this incredible swirl of material. And that's being planned by the Intuitive Machines IM3 mission. Yes? There are swirls in many places. And in fact, if you get into uh, the Lunar 100, so 
you're all familiar with the Messier catalog and going through the Messier catalog of deep sky objects. Well, there's the similar uh, uh, Chuck Woods Lunar 100 is these 100 features across the surface of the moon going from easy to really difficult. I, item number 100 is a group of swirls on the floor and around Mare Marginis on the extreme eastern edge of the moon. And it's actually a little bit onto the far side of the moon and libration has to be just right. The wobble of the moon has to be right to bring it over into view for you. So uh, um, these the, there are a number of places where we have these lunar swirls. And as you point out, yes, they're on the near side, they're on the far side. For the most part, we see them in the dark Mari area, but they're not confined to the dark Mari area. They even extend into the high islands. So um, they are very mysterious. They're very interesting. And we're going to the prototype of one with the Intuitive Machines IM3 mission. But a lot of the activity that you've been hearing about focuses on the South Pole. And... Uh, the South Pole actually occurs on the edge of a large crater called Shackleton Crater. Shackleton is big and it is deep and dark. When I say deep, it's about three times the depth of the Grand Canyon. And it's very, very dark and very, very cold. But the South Pole is right on the rim of Shackleton Crater. And so this immediate area around Shackleton is an area we want to explore. Now our first venture in landing in the vicinity of the South Pole will be in a crater called Malapert A. You can see it circled there in red up the top. This is at about latitude minus 80. So it's not right at the pole, but this is our first stab at landing at this, you know, extreme latitude. And here you can see Malapert A is this, you know, very degraded crater right in the middle there. Not the, not the more obvious one above center, but it's right in the middle. It's not much to look at, but that is, that is where we're going to try and test out landing at this extreme latitude. It is... Let me see if I can get back to it. Um, it is this thing right here. It is a degraded. Okay, I'm going to say it. It's an ugly looking crater. <laughs> but that's where we're going. And that will be the Intuitive Machines IM-1 mission. So again, those, these are private companies that will be delivering payloads. So, you know, NASA will have payloads, but other u universities, other countries, uh, private companies doing all kinds of different things. You can buy space on board these, and there'll be all kinds of things on the manifest, not just NASA payloads. We're just buying some space. Now, a little while back, NASA announced 13 candidate regions for where we would consider having our astronauts land at the South Pole. These are called the Artemis regions. These are the candidate spots for where we're going to go. And the criteria for these basically boil down to, it's gotta be flat enough and smooth enough to land safely. It's got to be close to an area of very great scientific interest, like a permanently shadowed region, but it's gotta be in an area that gets sufficient sunlight to actually be able to work comfortably and safely and get power. It's got to be an area that is free of hazards, such as boulders or concentrated craters. And it's got to be in an area that has good communications possibilities. As you mentioned, the Earth 
will just be skimming along the horizon. And if there are hills and mountains, it can go behind those and you've lost your line of communication. So you got to figure out the perspective from where you're going to be. Are you going to have a clear shot at the earth to get those communications? So those are some of the main criteria that we use in figuring out where we're going to send our astronauts. And in addition to sending our astronauts, we will also be sending robotic probes to some of these areas. So here we have an area coming out from the edge of Shackleton Crater, extending over to a crater you see just to the left, that's de Gerlache. And there's a ridge connecting Shackleton and de Gerlache. It's connecting ridge. And that has appeared to be a very interesting area that we could conceivably land on. And so uh, maybe sending the Apollo astro or the Artemis astronauts there, but first we'll send the Intuitive Machines IM2 lander there. Then looking on the edge of de Gerlache Crater, on the rim, so here's de Gerlache Crater, and on that far rim, we are considering uh, some places that possibly we could be sending our astronauts. Again, it meet, they meet our criteria. Um, down in the lower left here, uh, you see the uh, de Gerlache Coker Massif. And this is a mountain, this is the furthest onto the far side of the moon of any of these sites. It is actually on the far side of the moon, but it is on a mountaintop that sticks up high enough that it'll have a line of sight with the Earth. And it sticks up high enough that, that's the neat thing, you have permanently shadowed craters, but also near the South Pole, we have mountains that stand up high enough that they get almost constant sunlight. So you have almost constant supply of power. Yes. So how do you decide on the names? So there is actually a international group called the International Astronomical Union that gets together and they assign names to locations on the moon. And you may think, wow, I would really like to have a crater on the moon named after me. So the first criteria in having a crater named after you is you have to be dead. Okay, that doesn't sound so good anymore. Um, but um, there, there, there were actually three exceptions to that. Anyone know what they are? That's right, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Colin. Or, uh, yeah. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, three craters in the Sea of Tranquility. But aside from that, um, and it's basically scientists, philosophers, people famous who have been dead for a while and still remain great in our minds. So um, that's how these names came to be. It's voted on by a whole bunch of people who aren't dead. Um, so then we have... Um, Another crater in the lunar vicinity there, Haworth Crater. And on the edge of Haworth Crater, this rugged lunar highland gets a little bit smoother. And uh, so this looks actually like a reasonable place to uh, go exploring. Again, you've got nice, dark, 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 cold craters um, in the vicinity, but you've also got good landing opportunities. Then here is a really interesting feature. This is Malapert Massif. And this is a tall mountain ridge that sticks up so high that, again, it gets almost constant sunlight. This has been called, somewhat inappropriately, the Ridge of Eternal Sunlight. But it's almost that. And, but right around it, you have these places of permanent shadow. So being able to have... a a near constant supply of solar energy next to what could be supplies of water ice. This looks pretty interesting. Yeah. I'm really focused on 
There is none. There is no vertical exaggeration in this view. Yes. So the South Pole is not anything like the Sea of Tranquility. This is this is this is tough stuff. And so you will recall recently our partners in Japan, the Japanese Space Agency, uh, attempted a lunar landing with a precision landing system. And they purposefully said, we're going to land this on some really tilted, non-flat terrain. They targeted it. And they hit it perfectly. They, 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 they did a bullseye. I mean, all power to them. The only problem was just before it touched down, the nozzle of one of the rocket engines blew off. That's a problem. And so when it came down, it had some sideways component that it wasn't supposed to have. And so it touched the ground, hit, and it rolled, and it turned upside down. But they landed pretty much exactly where they wanted. But the idea here was, again, to test landing in something that is challenging, like we're going to find at the South Pole. And that's why we want to send some of these robotic probes there before we actually land our astronauts there. We're going to get a good handle on this. The idea is to end up having an outpost there on the moon. Well, you all have, we're having to do some scouting. You are having to do some scouting. And I'll, I'll show you some tools. Um, you, can, you, can, you can do this on your own. I'll show you. It's kind of fun. Um, okay. Uh, looking back at uh, Shackleton Crater, there's a rounded mountain peak just outside of Shackleton Crater. That's Shackleton Crater at the bottom there, and you see this kind of rounded mountain peak off to the side. Again, it's got good proximity to Shackleton, but it sticks up high enough to have good amount of sunlight, good line of sight to the earth. And it's, you know, not a jagged looking mountain peak. It's nice and rounded. It's got some potential. Um, then we have a site on the edge, on the rim of a crater here. This is the crater Faustini. And the area we're looking at is on this near rim here that's actually catching the sunlight. Uh, so again, uh, Faustini is this large, dark crater. And uh, then we have another landing site on a crater rim. This is a really big signpost crater here. We're looking at the crater Amundsen. And uh, the area that we're looking at landing is this illuminated area just in the foreground of Amundsen. But, man, that's beautiful. Could you imagine getting some nice panorama pictures in that area? There are some areas that actually are candidates, yes. And, uh, but then there's along the edge of Nobile Crater. And here you see Nobile Crater tilted. Nobile is tilted at this strange angle against this great big mountain peak. But that mountain peak, as you can see, it has a nice flat top. It's a good thing. It's about, you know, it's, it's, it's taller than Mount Everest. That's a big mountain but it has a relatively flat top. And uh, so we're planning to, not only that's a possibility of where we're gonna send our uh, astronauts, but it's also where we're planning to send a robotic rover called Viper. And Viper is the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, a really cool name. And what Viper is, is it is a robotic prospector. We know there is water ice at the South Pole of the Moon. We found it with Elcross. 
Now, I get to say this because I, I worked on El Cross. I was part of it from the initial proposal to mission closeout. It was my life for a while. Viper was, or El Cross was blunt force trauma lunar exploration. Basically, what we did is um, launched on a big Atlas V rocket. After climbing out of the atmosphere, let go of the first stage, it fell back to the ocean, fired the second stage, which took our spacecraft into orbit. Fired the second stage again, taking us out of orbit. Now, at that point, you would typically throw away that upper stage. At that point, it just becomes dead weight. Well, we held on to it. We wanted that dead weight. And we carried it all the way to the moon, and a very circuitous path to the moon. But eventually, we came approaching the moon, screaming straight in toward the lunar south pole. And we turned our little spacecraft around, aiming that big centaur upper stage toward one of those permanently shattered craters. Carefully aimed that centaur upper stage, let go of it, fired our retro rockets on our little spacecraft, and sent that upper stage, something about the size of a school bus, but moving at 5,600 miles an hour, considerably faster than your average school bus and sent it screaming down into this permanently shadowed crater. It slammed down into the surface, blasted tons and tons and tons of material out of the floor of that crater, out of the shadows, into the sunlight, high into the sky of the moon. And then our little spacecraft do dove down into that debris, sniffed it and analyzed it, and that's how we discovered water ice. Four minutes after the Centaur hit, our little spacecraft hit, mission over. Four very busy minutes. But because we had done that, we had discovered water ice on the moon. We knew it was there. But because of the way it was sampled, we had no way of knowing how it was distributed. How deep was it? How is it spread out? As our chief scientist, Tony Colaprete, used to like to say, is it like smooth style peanut butter or chunky style peanut butter? We don't know. And if we're thinking about water ice as a resource that we're going to use, then we really have to know how deep it is, how it's distributed, how accessible it is. And when you're talking about resources, answering those questions is done by prospecting. That's something people here on Earth have done for a long, long time. And that's what we're going to be doing on the moon with Viper. And uh, this mission is being run just down the road here at NASA Ames. Yay! And uh, yeah, we're, we've got a big test bed now where the cameras are being tested out. It's, a, it's, it's very exciting. It's neat times. This is really going to happen. So um, Viper is going to that area and it'll land again on one of these Clips landers, Astrobotics Griffin lander, and then it'll roll off a ramp and go exploring. Now, I mentioned some of the criteria that we talk about when we're landing. Well, recently we've added some more because people have done some looking and you see, remember we talked about those lobate scarps with Apollo 17, the earthquake scarps? Oh, there's a bunch of them in the South Pole. You can see some here near the crater de Gerlache. And so now what we also have to look at is seismic risk analysis. And not just whether you're landing next to one of these scarps, but also when you land someplace, how stable is that area going to be? If it starts shaking, is that land going to move? And so one of the ways we actually test this is we look for, remember we saw boulder tracks before? Well, we can look, in fact, we train, we do machine, la machine learning training to look for boulder tracks. To look for rockfall, because it turns out those boulder tracks, those boulders, 
end up being very good geotechnical probes of the aspects of the land over which the boulders are rolling. You can tell a lot about the landscape from the tracks left behind by these boulders. So we've got an additional criteria now. Now moving a little bit away from the South Pole, we'll go to the far side of the moon, the laser altimetry view. And here you see uh, we are color coding the moon. So orange is high, purple is low. And you can see this big purplish area covering much of the far side of the moon. This is the South Pole Aitken Basin. This is the largest and oldest impact crater that we know of on the moon. Four plus billion years probably. It's been degraded by later impacts all around it, but it's big. It's like 2,000 kilometers across. This is a monster. And it quite possibly excavated down deep enough to actually have excavated up some of the lunar mantle material. We would love to sample some of that. Um, so what we want to do is explore some of this South Pole Aiken Basin area. And what we'd like to do is take a crater that has been superimposed on it and has kind of dug down into it. And we have an example of that right here. And so what we're planning to do is go flying down into this Schrodinger Basin. And it's a really interesting area. This will be the Draper CP-12. See, there are a bunch of companies building these landers. Yeah. An order? Orbiter. Uh, with this one, there will have to be because we're going to have to do communication relay. And someone asked me earlier, uh, you know, hey, what's the idea behind, you know, why would we want to have this uh, orbital gateway around the moon? Well, there's one of the reasons right there. Because when you start having stuff on the far side of the moon, you don't have a line of sight of communications with the Earth, do you? So you need something in an orbit they can see the far side of the moon, but that also doesn't lose sight of the Earth. Okay. But that's, so this Draper CP-12 will land within the Schrodinger Basin. But remember, that's just a crater on the side of this greater South Pole Aiken Basin. So much more ambitious is a uh, mission in the early stages of planning now called Endurance. And this would be a robotic rover that would land kind of on the north edge of the South Pole Aiken Basin and go on an epic journey traveling across the South Pole Aiken Basin, stopping at key areas of interest, gathering samples continuing all the way across the South Pole Lake and Basin, making its way to the South Pole, where it would then rendezvous with our astronauts and give them the treasures that it had collected along the way. I'd have to look. Um, it's thousands. Yeah. Rover. Rover. Another area that we've just announced is going to be a target is the Ina Caldera. This is a prime example of something called an irregular Mari patch or imp. In the Ina Caldera, there's another challenge object for amateur astronomers. You see this kind of D-shaped caldera in the middle there. And as we zoom down to it, we see that it looks really weird. It's kind of amoeba shape. And what we see is we see these rounded mounds. And between them, you have this kind of jumbled, rougher terrain. Now, we know that this is, in fact, a volcanic caldera. 
and it's on top of one of these broad, low slope shield volcanoes. But when we look at this weird stuff within the caldera, this weird landform, again, we see these kind of bulbous hills. And those have reasonable number of craters on the top, impact craters. But then the slopes, the sides of those hills are very, very steep, very sharp. That speaks of young terrain, something that hasn't been eroded. But then you look at the terrain between those bulbous hills and you see an almost complete lack of impact craters. And counting impact craters is our primary way of estimating the age of real estate on the moon. If you have a piece of real estate over time, it's going to be peppered by impact craters. And the older that real estate is, the more craters it's going to have. And then if there's an eruption and there's a flow of lava that covers it over, now we were back to having no craters. Hey, that's fresh new lava, yeah, real estate. Now, our understanding of the thermal history of the moon is that volcanism on the moon should have stopped about one billion years ago. The moon cooled down enough, the crust became thick enough that volcanic eruptions came to an end. But when we look at this terrain between these bulbous hills, we don't see impact craters. This is, seems to be telling us, hey there, I'm really young terrain. Instead of a billion years or more old, we're seeing something that seems to be telling us I might be maybe only a couple tens of millions of years old. That's the same age as the Sibley volcanic features you have just down the road here. Relatively new stuff. How can that work? That doesn't make sense to us. That doesn't fit with our thermal modeling of the moon at all. So are we wrong about our basic geophysical understanding of the moon? Or is there perhaps something else going on? One of the theories is perhaps this material is just fundamentally different. One of the things that's been propo proposed is this was kind of a lava froth that got erupted, very vesiculated. Remember uh, seatbelt rock. So imagine something that was very foamy. And one of the things we find is that if you take a solid concrete-like material and you hit it with an impact or you develop a big hole, but if you take something that's like foam and you hit it with an impactor, that impactor will just shoot right through it and you might have a very little hole. So maybe what we're seeing here is old terrain that just does a very good job of keeping a youthful look. So interesting theories. We don't know just what's going on though. So we want to go and find out. And then there's the lunar antipodal region, the area on the moon directly opposite the Earth. And this area is of particular interest to us. This area is interesting because it is the one place on that we know of in the solar system where we can do the really profound type of radio astronomy that we would love to do because we are really noisy here on earth. We've got radio stations and TV stations and all kinds of electronics going on. And if you're a radio astronomer, this is the bane of your existence. And there are virtually no places in the solar system you can go and get away from all the noise we are splatting out there. With one exception, the far side of the moon. It is always turned away from the Earth, and it always has the thick layers of rock between you and the Earth. This is the radio quiet place in the solar system. And so the idea is, remember the big Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico? So imagine building a giant version of that inside a crater on the far side of the moon. And with this, we could listen back 
to the cosmic dark ages, the time when the very first stars in the universe were turning on. The moon would provide a quiet enough environment for us to do that. So that's why this far side of the moon beckons to us. So the images I've shared with you tonight were all generated through a lunar data visualization and analysis portal that my team at NASA has developed called the Moontrek portal. Moontrek portal is part of a family of portals that we've developed for a, variety, a growing number of worlds throughout the solar system. And with the Moontrek portal, you can zoom, you can pan. We'll pan down here to the crater Tycho. We'll zoom on in. And the first thing you might want to know is how big is Tycho? Well, that's very easy to find out. It's as simple as drawing a line. So we'll just draw a line from one side of Tycho to the other. And we can measure it. And it's 83.76. That's a big hole in the ground. The next thing you might want to know is, well, how deep is Tycho? Again, that's as easy as drawing a line. We'll draw a line across Tycho here. And we will generate an elevation profile. So we'll hit submit. And here we can see, let's move Tycho a little bit off to the side and we can actually measure the heights of mountains, the depths of valleys very easily. You can conduct your own exploration of the lunar surface. Now, another thing you can do is you can draw a bounding box around any terrain that you like. And so we're gonna draw a bounding box around Tycho and then it's going to give you an option of, do you want an STL or OBJ? You can generate 3D print files to send to your 3D printer. You can make 3D prints of anything on the moon you want. Is this fun? These disappear from my desk really quickly. Now, another thing you can do is you can switch into interactive 3D mode and you can actually go flying. So using your mouse and your standard keyboard game control keys, you can fly down into craters, fly over the landscape. You can go roving along the surface. This is fun. So this is the public facing view of um, these tools, which we provide for mission planners and planetary scientists that you know have all the actual landing site and traverse planning analysis tools. But we make this these tools available to the general public. This is all web-based. You don't buy anything, you don't install anything, you just point your browser to trek.nasa.gov. Yes. A game? Yeah, actually we've, we have actually provided lunar landscapes to game makers. So some of our terrains, you know, we have the terrain, we have the lunar terrain in great detail, you know, in a lot of places down to, you know, meter resolution. So, and the, so this is, you know, you, you talk about, well, how, how do you find flat places? Well, you can go searching for them right here. You can use this tool from home. Now, another thing that you can do that is really fun is you can take your mouse and you can draw a path anywhere you want across the surface. And then the portal will come back to you with a QR code. Take that QR code, scan it into your smartphone, and then put your smartphone in a pair of cheap $5 Google Cardboard compatible goggles. Whatever path you drew, you will now fly in virtual reality. You can make your own virtual reality experiences here. This is fun. And a new thing we've added, just to get a scale, you can take any state, or any country, and you can drag an outline of it on the moon so you can see how big it is. I recently did Alabama here because I was in Alabama and there's a really nice impact crater in Alabama, the Wetumpka impact crater. And you know, kids can go visit it. And you, you can now you can compare the Wetumpka crater with craters on the moon. It's really cool. And you can you know, change the color. So I can change, I can change Alabama from a red state to a blue state with just a click of a button. You know, it's really neat. Um, so 
These are the NASA solar system tracks. Again, this is what I've used to generate all these views that you've had of the moon tonight. This is what is being used now. Uh, versions of this are being used to plan landing sites, plan upcoming traverses, and these are tools that you can use. We have this for the moon, we have this for Mars, and we have versions of this for a growing number of worlds throughout our solar system. I invite you to come explore with us. If I haven't rendered you all unconscious, I will try to uh, take some questions. Oh, not at all. Um, I'll, I'm going to change the screen here so people can submit questions via chat as well as ask them here. So anybody in the um, um, uh, Zoom audience, uh, use your chat to ask the question. I know it's a different interface this time than our previous talks. Uh, and uh, uh, but the chat should function just fine for this. I'm going to take this. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience here? Yeah. Apollo did the mission. Was there a difference in structure module? Um. So, the specifically the J missions uh, were the uh, fifteen. 16 and 17. And the main difference there was taking along the lunar roving vehicles. So in the case of Apollo uh, 11 and 12, the astronauts were limited to just walking. And they did their exploration just strictly on foot and what they could pick up and carry with them. Um, on Apollo 14, they actually had a little hand truck that they were able to pull, you know, a couple handles. And so they could put their samples aboard that and carry their tools aboard that. Um, but then with 15, 16, and 17, these were the J-class missions. And now with the rovers, you had the ability to go vast distances that you could not have gone uh in the previous missions and see a wider variety of terrain so um the primary difference was in terms of what they carried with them the basic design of the lunar module remained fairly constant yes uh, if apollo 13 landed from Earth, where would apollo 17 what would have been the next one um no here here let's try oh, you got it try that again yep so there are very a variety of areas under consideration one of the areas that was being looked at very seriously was an area called the marius hills and uh, yeah, so the Marius Hills is an area located between the Aristarchus Plateau and Reiner Gamma. And it shows up wonderfully in your telescopes if you get the Terminator right on it, because it's, it's this amazing field of about, well, well over a hundred volcanic cones and domes and sinuous rills between them. Now, again, these are lunar volcanoes so that, you know, if, if you catch them with broad sunlight, you don't see anything at all. But if you get the Terminator right there next to them, they leap out at you. And they're wonderful to see. So try them. But this area had seen volcanic activity, prolonged volcanic activity over the course of billions of years. And so sampling the uh, Marius Hills area would enable us to take a look at the geophysical evolution of the moon, seeing erupted materials over a prolonged period of time and seeing how the interior of the moon has changed, you know, seeing, you know, getting some really key insights. Um, we don't have an announced 
You know, you notice Marius Hills was not in my presentation here. We have not announced that as a destination yet. I think you can safely count on seeing it come up sometime in the future. It's just too cool a place to resist. And for the uh, early 60s, a lot of uh, uh, astronomers were wanting to the area around Aristarchus. Aristarchus to see if they could actually see volcanic eruptions. There was some, at the time, we didn't know how alive it was geologically. Well, Aristarchus and a few other areas are actually known as centers for transient lunar phenomena. And back then, people would say they were seeing sudden brightenings, sudden glows, some weird blurriness appear. And a lot of the serious astronomical community took that not very seriously. But there has been some evidence that this is really happening. So what's going on? We don't think it's classic volcanism, but perhaps through something like radioactive decay, you have buildup of material, that, you know, gas that can puff out. Um, we also know that one, one of the cool things that we know is that um, we do see flashes on the moon from meteoroid impacts. And this happens a few times a month. See some, and this is something that this is an area where amateur astronomers are really playing a key role. Uh, through the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, ALPO, there is a group within ALPO that specifically looks for these flashes of meteoroid impacts. That's cool stuff. And back during the Laddie mission, so that's a mission that didn't come up tonight, but that's another mission I got to be a part of. It was very cool. It's called the Lunar Dust and Atmospheric uh, I should know this, L-E-D-E-E, -E. lunar dust, anyway, uh, lunar atmosphere and dust environment explorer, got it, and uh, it's been a long day, um, but basically, again, one of the things I learned when I was a kid is the moon has no atmosphere, the moon is absolutely no atmosphere, uh, that's also wrong. You know, I learned the moon was geologically dead, the moon was dry, the moon has no atmosphere. Man, everything I learned back in school about the moon was wrong. But that's that's kind of exciting. That's where you really get to learn neat stuff is when, you know, wow. Um, the moon has an atmosphere. It has a very thin atmosphere, something we call a surface boundary exosphere. Super, super thin. It's about the same density as the Earth's atmosphere at the level of the International Space Station when our astronauts take a spacewalk. Super, super, super thin. But this is actually the most common type of atmosphere in our solar system. We see surface boundary exospheres around you know, Mercury, the moon, larger asteroids, moons of some of the other planets. And so we wanted to understand the composition of the lunar atmosphere, its structure, and its variation over time, and how dust might, being lo might be lofted into that atmosphere from impacts and perhaps from electrostatic levitation. And so we sent a spacecraft to the moon, sent it orbiting the moon, and then dropped it down low have it fly through the lunar atmosphere. And as we had Laddie flying through the lunar atmosphere, we asked the amateur astronomer community to please monitor the moon and look for flashes. What we would love to do is correlate lunar impacts with changes that we see in the lunar atmosphere. And it turns out, you know, Laddie was orbiting for some time, and we see a real interesting correlation in changes in things like sodium in the lunar atmosphere in accordance with meteor showers. 
So we see, um, you know, when we know known meteor showers, we see these changes in the structure of the atmosphere. That's neat. That's amateur astronomers doing that. Um, strangely, there's one change we see in the composition that doesn't occur with a known meteor shower. And so now what we really want to do is get amateurs going out and looking for this meteor shower. It's just one that we haven't noticed yet. Um, we have a question from Mike on uh, Facebook. Um, how hard is the ice in these deep south pole craters? Do we have any... Sense? How hard is the ice? We don't know. Well, I guess you could take a bucket of water and bring it down to eight degrees Kelvin. Yeah, but 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 the thing is, is you know, is it that concentrated? Yeah. Is the water just like a slab of water ice, or is it mixed in with all the grains of rock? And so, so there's there's a lot of variables here. And so, again, what we know, the only thing we know is there is water ice there, but how it's distributed what depth it is, how it's mixed in with, we don't know any of that. We need Viper and things like Viper to answer those kinds of questions. Go ahead, Bob. All right. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And uh, Alphonsus has been one of those locations on the moon that has been a place that people have looked for and have apparently seen uh, these transient lunar phenomena. And there's, you know, there's actually, we've had instruments in orbit that seem to have caught apparent outgassings. Yeah. Yeah, Alphonsus is a fascinating place and um the it is an example of what we call a floor fractured crater. And so if you look at it for its size, for its diameter, its depth is shallower than you would expect. And what seems to have happened is that magma beneath the crater has pushed up and has pushed the floor of that crater up like a piston. And as it has risen up, as you might expect, that brittle rock of the floor of that crater has cracked. And so you see these fractures on the floor of the crater. And as you point out, along many of these fractures, you have craters that don't look like impact craters. They don't, they're rimless. These are volcanic craters and they are surrounded by dark halos. Again, that's why we thought Shorty Crater uh, back in uh, the Taurus Littrow Valley might be a fresh crater. It had that dark halo. Well, it fooled us. But in Alphonsus, we do have these volcanic craters surrounded by dark deposits of pyroclastic ash. And so clearly a lot of interesting stuff has happened in Alphonsus in the past. Is it still possibly happening there now? We don't have active volcanism there anymore. But as you say, there have been detections and now people are starting to take it a lot more seriously. We've gotten spectral evidence of gas emissions uh, on the moon. Yes, that's right. Yes.
So how do we know that, uh, so I mean, the, the question works two ways. So um, we have rocks from the earth that have gotten transported to the moon and we have rocks from the moon that, you know, as we say, we have impacts on the moon all the time. And so I have here a moon rock that I brought with me tonight. You can all come up and look at it. This is one of those breaches we talked about, kind of a Frankenstein rock, different types of rock molded together. And you look at, well, how do you know that's a you know? And there are certain telltale types of mineralogies that differentiate moon rocks from earth rocks. Now, one of the things that we saw with the earth rock was that it had been in an oxidizing environment that you would not expect to find on the moon. So um, you can find um, that the pressures that it formed under, in the case of the Earth, it would have been, had to be in at a depth of about 12 miles. Whereas if it had formed on the moon, it would have to have been more like at a depth of 60 miles. And the chances of it being excavated from that kind of a depth aren't very good. Um, Something we see a lot on the moon. Again, you look up at the moon, you see dark areas and you see light areas. The dark areas are basalt. Okay, we have basalt all you know, Go out to the Mojave Desert, go to Hawaii, you'll find basalt everywhere. Okay, there's some telltale differences. Again, you know, the lunar basalt has, tends to be, in general, much lower in silica. But the light areas on the moon, the light areas on the moon, that that's, tends to be a rock called a anorthosite. And anorthosite is very, very common on the moon. Remember, this is that frothy crust that formed on top of the magma ocean. You don't find nearly as much anorthosite on the Earth. As a matter of fact, you find relatively little of it. There's a great exposure of it in Greenland that uh, we have gotten large quantities from at NASA Ames. It turns out, this is, here's a bit of wonderful weirdness for you. There is a great, wonderful exposure of anorthosite here in California, the San Gabriel Mountains. And you can actually drive up to the side of the road and you can scoop up anorthosite. I've loaded a whole bunch into my little SUV a whole bunch of times and driven it back. Um, really cool stuff. Now, it's weathered in a way that you don't see on the moon. You know, it doesn't, you know, the lunar north site doesn't get rained on very much. <laughs> but, um, but still, it's neat to be able to say, look, here's this kind of stuff that's rare on Earth. But, you know, there's a long day trip. You can go get some. Yeah, we got we're we're getting to uh, the uh, our limits on the room. So I have one more question from uh, somebody on Zoom. Uh, Bill asked, uh, "Is there any concern that there might be microorganisms frozen in the ice, or is that part of the topic of discussion?" So we don't expect to find microorganisms alive on the moon. Um, if you want to sterilize something, then submitting it to the kind of conditions you would find on the moon is just about the best way to do it. But I've actually seen paper by some very serious people who are looking at the potential of what well, we know earth rocks have been blasted to the moon. Could we possibly find fossil you know, fossil earth, earth fossils yeah, yeah. on the moon. Interesting idea. Yeah. All right. I think I think we have to yeah. call it quits. All right. Uh, yeah, this is very engaging. This is a great, great talk tonight. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to say this with regard to an orthocyte, there's a marvelous uh, episode of from Earth to Jeff and it's the Apollo. 
It's it's anyway they they they. I <laughs> 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 Yeah, if you can coil that up for me. There, we'll see. Uh, one of the things that we're really <laughs> interested in is looking at 